my name is Hero Job Shibe, and this is Musings of a Shy Podcast, a Dogecoin peer to peer sharing economy show. And you are listening to episode 19. Marty, you must go back to the future. On this episode, I am I will be covering the timeline of the Silk Road, Mt. Gox, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin world, or basically the history of Bitcoin, and all this relation relating to the Bitcoin price. It's important to understand the length of time that the Silk Road marketplace existed, its relationship to an interaction to the overall Bitco, Bitcoin ecosystem, and the relationship to the price of Bitcoin. But before we get into the episode, I'm going to cover some news and some charity shout out. Here's the news. So here's the news. It'll be very brief. We have a lot to cover on this episode. A Bitcoin is now going to be accepted on Facebook through Change Tip. Previous, there has been attempts to use uh, cryptocurrencies. It started with Dogecoin and then it was expanded to other cryptocurrencies on Facebook. But then Facebook changed its policies and it was regulated to just being you, you being able to tip within groups. It appears that Change Tip will not be limited by the, those same terms and you can be capable of tipping people with Bitcoin on Facebook. So that's a big news for Bitcoin. Some other news, it's a little little bit of a note. It might have to do with the Silk Road trial being so prominent in the uh, news lately. On Wikipedia, Bitcoin is, in the English language, is the number 88th article being read on Wikipedia. A great many people are coming to Wikipedia and reading about Bitcoin, which is good for the overall awareness of the coin itself. And then the last tidbit in the Dogecoin world, Africa to the moon um, has been in the news. Uh, You may have seen the gentleman, uh, Jonathan Waltman, uh, doing uh, various news or press uh, junkets where he talks about his efforts to bring a space program uh, to the continent of Africa. And there'll be more about that in the charity shout outs. So that's it for the news. Now for charity shout outs. So this charity shout out is a bit of a follow up on some charities that uh, Dogecoin has been assisting over the past year. Uh, there was a Ghana for medical help. Uh, it was a charity effort to to help give medical supplies to various hospitals within the country of Ghana. Uh, there was like $955 raised in Dogecoin. Uh, there has been an update on what was brought, what type of equipment was utilized, and it was in just a, a great little update on how that helped. So the Ghana Medical Help uh, just came on Dogecoin about five hours ago today and they just updated and shared pictures and basically told uh, what what the efforts that Dogecoin has done in order to help uh, bring some medical aid to this to the country of Ghana. March for Doge has done an update and their update is in regards to the to the to the, to the um, <clears throat> March for Doge has done an update and basically what it is is they have had to change the place and the time upon which the March for Doge is taking place. A lot of it has to do with the city of Minneapolis not being able to work with the organization to in a timely fashion to make sure that this event can take place. They are moving it to the university, which means that there's going to be an additional cost. But the March for Doge has stated that they are going to pay for the additional cost. The, the event itself may in fact take place uh, indoors instead of outdoors or a combination of both. Uh, I have a link in the show notes about uh, the updates and there will be further updates as events transpire but there has been an update about the march for doge and how it's changing from taking place in the spring and possibly moving later on to almost almost summertime it seems and then doge for robots is still accepting donate donations for their organization i did an interview with ray one of the students that is uh, a member of the 502 boss bots team that is accepting donations for supporting their their little robot program uh there will be a link in the show notes but you can also go and check out 
the Google Hangout on my YouTube channel, or you can listen to the audio episode, which will be coming out this Tuesday, January 20th. And you can listen to the, the podcast version of that interview. And then lastly, Africa to the Moon. Africa to the Moon is a program that is seeking to bring a space program to the, the state of Africa. Jonathan Waltman is, or Juno, is the project administrator for the Africa to the Moon mission. Uh, basically what they've done is they, you know, they went on to Dogecoin and they've been going around to various news organizations and, and various grant places. And they are seeking to bring forth an effort to bring a space program, to develop a space program within Africa. Uh, as of right now, uh, there has been, a, it looks like there's been a, quite a bit of a Dogecoin uh, donated towards this programming effort. Uh, they are doing a crowdfunding program where you can donate to Africa to the Moon. I will have a link in the show notes, but basically it's a foundation for space development. It's coming out of the country of South Africa and they want to be able to send uh, rockets into space and particularly they want to be able to land a robot on the moon. Uh, this program is has a, a lot of uh, countries involved, and it, it, Algeria, Egypt, Tunisia, Nigeria, Morocco, and South Africa all have national space agencies. And basically, what they're doing is the African Union Work Group space has agreed on a draft for African space policies and a framework for developing a, a draft of space strategy. So basically, what it is is an effort to unite the various companies, or not companies, but countries within the state of Africa within the continent of Africa to unite together around a cause and develop a technology technology program that would unite them and not only boost their uh, economy but just their overall projections of themselves onto the world so that is something that Dogecoin is helping out there's an official Dogecoin page where you can donate your Dogecoin towards this effort and it's called Africa to the Moon so that's it for our charity shout outs. Now on to the rest of the episode. Project Archivist, the podcast that talks about the weird, the wonderful, and the strange. Join us every week as your hosts, Rojan and Lobo, take a different look at the world around us through guest interviews, discussion, or taking a look at the week's weirdest news. Find us at www.projectarchivist.com, on iTunes in the podcast section, or on the Stitcher Android app. Marketplace was established in January of 2011. But before we can get into the timeline of Silk Road, we must first speak about Bitcoin because Bitcoin is the mechanism that enabled Silk Road to flourish because Bitcoin was the payment option that the, the vendors and the buyers could utilize on Silk Road to be not only have an anonymous uh, transactions, but also to get real world value for their, their goods and services and the purchases that they made. So in order to, to talk about Silk Road, we must first speak about the history of Bitcoin. And Bitcoin began according to the history of Bitcoin.org in 2007. So Toshi Nakamoto, the legend, was working on the concept of Bitcoin in 2007. While he's on record as living in Japan, it is speculated that Nakamoto may be a collective of pseudonyms for more than one person. Even here, here in the year 2015, it is not known who is Satoshi Nakamoto exactly. Nobody knows. Nobody knows if it's a single individual or a group of individuals. But for the purpose of this discussion, we're just going to consider him to be a person and it could not even be a he it could be a, a she but we're just going to treat satoshi nakamoto as the creator of bitcoin and the sole individual responsible for this concept so then we jump all the way into the year 2008 in august 15th of 2008 an interesting 
patent application was issued to the U.S. Patent Office. It was done by Neil Kinn, Vladimir Oskman, and Charles Bray. They filed this application for an encryption patent application. All three individuals deny a connection to Soshi Nakamoto and the alleged originator of the Bitcoin concept. But if you look at this application, it eerily looks and feels and in general many consider to be the actual patent for the concept of Bitcoin. And then August 18th of 2008, Bitcoin org is registered. So three days after the patent, this mysterious patent was uh, registered. Bitcoin.org is registered. The Dominion was registered at anonymousspeech.com, a site that allows users to anonymously register domain names and currently accepts Bitcoin. And then, like almost three months later, in October 31st, of 2008, the white paper is is published. It's called Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer electronic cash system, written by Satoshi Nakamoto, and is as associate at gmx.com, www.bitcoin.org, is where this paper was originally published and then distrib- and then disseminated throughout the internet afterwards. And basically, the published paper just breaks down the concept of Bitcoin and that the Bitcoin currency solves the problem of double spinning and it it prevents the currency from being copied. So basically what Satoshi Nakamoto establishes is that this is a payment option on the internet, a form of currency that can be utilized on the internet and that it is not only a means of transferring wealth from one individual to another, but is a means of, of secure means of doing so that you don't have to worry about it being copied of being it corrupted or broken into. And then January 3rd, 2009, just a, a couple months right after uh, publishing the paper, the first Genesis block of Bitcoin is created. This uh, Genesis block is established at uh, 6.15 Um, GMT time. So the first Bitcoin block was mined. And then the following day, version 0.0 Bitcoin is released. And basically what version 0.1 is the Bitcoin wallet and address and the mining application that allows people to not only mine Bitcoin, but also to hold their Bitcoins. So the, the software program, they established Bitcoin's existence is released to the public. And the first transaction from one Bitcoin being transferred to another individual was done on January 12th in 2009. It it came out of the Bitcoin currency and came out of block 170 and it takes place between Satoshi and Hal Finney, a developer of cryptograph and cryptographic activists. So that's the first time that the the Bitcoin currency in and of itself was utilized. And this is in January 12th of 2009. And then several months later, in October 5th of 2009, an exchange rate is established. New Liberty Standard publishes a Bitcoin exchange rate that establishes the value of Bitcoin at 1,000, about 1,000, just to make it simple, 13K of Bitcoin equals one US, US dollar. And they establish this by using the equation that includes the cost of electricity to run the computer that generated Bitcoins. So up to this point in Bitcoin's existence in 2009, you could still use a PC or a laptop to mine Bitcoin to generate the Bitcoin coins. This is before the, the advent of the specialized hardware. And then within the next couple months, there's been an update and then an increase of websites and RC chats devoted towards Bitcoin. And then to begin the new year, another exchange is born. It was born February 6th of 2010. It's called the Bitcoin Market. It was established by 
EW dollar as a Bitcoin currency exchange. So at this point in time, there had there had only been one Bitcoin type of exchange, and now there's another in existence. Within that same month, the encryption patent that was established in 2008, two years before, has been published. It's been approved by the U.S. Publishing Patent Office. And then three months after the establishment of the second Bitcoin exchange, on May 22nd, 2010, 10,000 BTC was spent on pizza. This is the first real, real world transaction using Bitcoins. It takes place in Jacksonville, Florida. A programmer named Lozas Hanesi offers to pay 10,000 Bitcoins for a pizza on the Bitcoin forum. At the time, the exchange rate put the purchasing price for the pizza around $25. So 10,000 BTC in 2010 was worth $25. And then two months after the pizza purchase, Splashdot, a tech uh, forum and magazine or webpage, published an article about Bitcoin. And this brings a lot of large number of new Bitcoin users. At this point, Bitcoin was a small word of mouth, very techy individuals were into Bitcoin. Uh, if you were very familiar with uh, computers and RC chats, you may have became aware of Bitcoin and you could have chose at that point in time in 2009 and the early part of 2010 to join Bitcoin. But at this point, there wasn't really a mass awareness. And this is the first article that speaks about Bitcoin, about this concept of cryptocurrency and the concept of internet money. After the article was released, uh, the price of Bitcoin increased tenfold over a ten dollar uh, over a five day period. On July twelfth, the, the value of Bitcoin increased ten times from 0 0.008 BCTC to 0 0.08 BTC, which that means is it was very much less than one cent in PT when the, before the article was established, and now. It's about worth eight cents in the real world of U.S. dollars on July 12th of 2010. So when you we're going to go into the price of Bitcoin. Now, CoinDesk, this is where I'm getting this information, does not track um, the price of Bitcoin prior to uh, July 17th. So after the article was published, established Bitcoin on July 12th as having a real world value of eight cents. On July 17th, it had a real world value of five cents. And by the end of July, July 31st, Bitcoin was at about six cents. So July 2010, Bitcoin was worth six cents. In USD. So you had an increased awareness of Bitcoin as a, uh, a means of payment system and options. And you also had uh, a real world transaction occurring. And more and more people becoming aware of Bitcoin. Now, another exchange established itself on July 17th, and that is Mt. Gox. Mt. Gox. The Bitcoin currency exchange was established by Jeb McClave, July 17th, 2010. Now you could change, exchange your Bitcoin for USD. You can sell your Bitcoin to other individuals who were, were not capable of mining, did not have the technical savvy to mine, or just simply wanted to purchase the coin outright instead of mining themselves. You could do this now on Mt. Gox. Now, Mt. Gox throughout the years, and we'll get into the Mt. Gox history, would eventually become one of the biggest Bitcoin exchanges. But it established itself on July 17, 2010, for the first time accepting Bitcoin. And so over the next few months, um, various uh, pools were established. Uh, there was more mining software being developed to mine Bitcoin. 
there was an exploit that generated 184 billion bitcoins. It was a vulnerability in the Bitcoin system. Um, there was an it caused a hard fork. It was corrected and Bitcoin became back on track. That occurred, the hard fork, this vulnerability occurred in August 15th of 2010, but it was corrected. And then you had um, more mining software established. There was more mining pools that were coming up, allowing for individuals to mine easier. And then in October 2010, the Financial Action Task Force, an intergovernmental group that develops and promotes policies to prevent money laundering and funding of terrorism, published in money laundering using new payment methods, and they warned about the use of digital currencies to finance terrorist groups. So this is the first governmental kind of action in a way that stated that Bitcoin could be used for illegal purposes. So this is the first comment by any government entity on Bitcoin. Mind you, Bitcoin had only existed roughly almost two years at this point. It'll be two years in January of 2011. And already the government is talking about Bitcoin. So let's talk about that. When the Bitcoin article by the government was released, in October of 2010, the price of Bitcoin in the beginning of the month was still around about five cents, six cents, and then it peaked around 10, and then around October 24th, it became 17 cents, and then it dropped some, and then it went back up. So eventually at the end of the month, after this government issue, the price of Bitcoin was 26 cents. So for a single Bitcoin was just a little bit over a quarter. Within that same period, October 10th, Mount Gox, um, one of the biggest uh, Bitcoin exchanges, changed its main funding option from PayPal to Liberty, Liberty Reserve. So you could no longer, at that point in time, use PayPal as a means of purchasing uh, Bitcoin. You could use Liberty Reserve to do so on the Mt. Gox website. Another important thing that happened in October was the first escrow transaction takes place. This is important because it, it establishes that the Bitcoin was now beginning to operate in the same financial manners that um, your dollar does or your pound or your currencies in general do. And just like in the real world, you now in Bitcoin, you can have an escrow. And the first escrow transaction took place between Dalabo D3 and Nanotube. And they had used a individual named Themos as a means of holding the escrow. So they had it. Diablo D3 and Nanotube had a transaction between the two of them, to the, to the two of themselves, and they used Themos to hold the funds until their 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 business was conducted and they both were satisfied and the the monies was released. And that's the first time the an escrow transaction would take place. Now here in the year 2015, escrows are, are done in a in the use of software, and and in a, soon to be going to be embedded in a lot of different uh, Bitcoin wallets and cryptocurrency wallets. But at this point in time in 2010, that had not yet happened, and it was done on an individual individual basis. And then in November 6, 2010. The calculated by the multiple number of Bitcoins in circulation by the last trade amount, Gox, the Bitcoin economy exceed $1 million. So the entire existence of Bitcoin up to this point, if you count up all the coins, they were all worth $1 million in USD. At this point in November, the price of Bitcoin for a single Bitcoin was 50 cents. And then you had Bitcoin IND compiled for Nokia and 
and in 900. So on the Bitcoin forum, a member named Double C compiles Bitcoin ND, which was written for the Nokia N900 mobile computer and was meant to be able to do the first mobile to mobile transaction, which occurred the following day. The first portable to portable transaction of Bitcoin occurs when Rubik sends WC 0.42 BCC using that program. So this is the first time that a mobile application was allowed, which makes makes it on par to what was already occurring in the real world when it comes to the use of credit card applications and the various um, Apple Pay and Google wallets that are coming along that this, this was happening with Bitcoin. And then it brings us up to the point of January 2011. This is when Silk Road was established. Now, January 2011, the price of Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin. Now, Bitcoin in the beginning of January, January 1st, was worth 29 cents. And it crashed down. At the end of January, after the establishment of Silk Road, Bitcoin was at 69 cents. And then I'm going to make one more price point before I go into the history of Silk Road. Uh, February 9th is the first time, February 9th of 2011 is the first time that Bitcoin was traded on Mt. Gox at $1. So February 9th is the first time in the history of Bitcoin and the history of economics that a digital concept, a digital currency that is Bitcoin was traded for a dollar. So one Bitcoin was equivalent to one US dollar. Now I'm not making the supposition or the connection that Silk Road is responsible for the the increase and almost tripling of the value of Bitcoin from January 1st to February 9th. What, why I'm making, I'm making this point to demonstrate that you can give a kid a nickel and a kid will be happy. You can give him a quarter or some pennies and he's happy to have a quarter or a penny. But for an adult, even if you give a kid a, a dollar, a kid's going to be ecstatic. But for adults, we deal with dollars, not cents. And when something that, that is on the internet, something that is this concept that is Bitcoin is now after two, almost a little bit of a year and more and some change of existence is now worth a dollar. People are going to use it. it. It ties in with psychology. It has value. It has meaning. And this helped fuel the possibility of Silk Road to be a good e-commerce place. With the establishment of Silk Road, and it was not the only business out there that accepted Bitcoin for goods and services. But for Silk Road, for them to accept Bitcoin, this anonymous uh, cryptocurrency, this payment system that you couldn't track exactly or completely using the conventional methods that people know to track Bitcoin. You can't necessarily track down users. There's a lot of effort that has to go into finding individuals and people. And even if you find that individual or person to establish the fact that their Bitcoin address that holds those Bitcoins in it is theirs, it's very hard to do. You would have to have the private keys. And if you don't have the private keys, you can't access that Bitcoin address and you cannot establish the fact that that individual owns that Bitcoin address. And so now we're going to go into the history of Silk Road because with the with the establishment of the concept of Silk Road, January 1st, 2011, the beginning, an unknown individual using the alias Altoid begins posting on the internet forums, uh, shumery.org and bitcointalk.org advertising a hidden tour service like an anonymous Amazon.com. Both of these early posts reference Silk Road 420 a wordpress.com that is no longer in existence. So this is when the talk of Silk Road was being established. And having, after being established, it took about a couple months for the word of it to be spread. A message appeared on Bitcoin Talk 
In one message, a poster revealed that Silk Road had been operational for three weeks with several sellers and buyers competing, completing 28 transactions. All of this was done on the, the, tour, the tour server system of Silk Road and it was, the payment method was Bitcoin. And then March 2nd, curiosity and suspicion. Bitcoin t- talk users respond with a mixture of curiosity and suspicion that such a site will work or even exist as a real service. The site was soon removed due to the fact that it is speaking of an illegal activity policy, but later was reinstated. And then March 10th is the first time a complaint was made against Silk Road. The first complaint of an unfulfilled order from Silk Road wrote, The user Silk Road replies, I'm very sorry, your seller flake. Hopefully you were pleased with your our refund policy, though we're actually the first unfulfilled order so far. So I'm confident if you place another that it will be fulfilled. And then some talk began to be used in reference to Silk Road through the various forms forums and posts um, circling around Bitcoin, all the, the, the Bitcoin talk and Bitcoin forums talking about Silk Road and its implications and the fact that they're out there on the Tor network exist a place if you're able to, to buy drugs anonymously over the internet and not necessarily as a killer app for Bitcoin, but I don't know what is. And this thought comes from a uh, psychedelish muse on Silk Road. And then in April of 2011, Silk Road hits a thousand users. So a thousand people have either downloaded or already have the Tor uh, software program using the Tor network are going to the Silk Road using Bitcoin and purchasing and buying um, drugs or other types of services. And then in June of 2011, uh, Silk Road hits the mainstream. The outside world begins to discover Silk Road with articles in the mainstream press and somewhat a predictable reaction from Silk Road. So an article was written about Silk Road. Um, and then an official forum was formed through the tour network where people were able to discuss uh, Silk Road that occurred like 17 days after uh, news articles started popping up about Silk Road. And the official Silk Road forums first appeared on tour to discuss issues specific to the site and its users. This is where the Dread Pirate Roberts makes his first post under the, the username Silk Road. This is the name used as a mouthpiece of Silk Road until February 2012. Now DPR, as I established earlier in the episode, is the the administrator of Silk Road and the individual that controlled the, the mechanisms that for the Silk Road running the website. And the government is alleging that DPR is Ross Ulbrich. And Ross Ulbrich has established that while he created Silk Road, that he is not DPR and that he had given up control of both Silk Road and any association to to DPR. But this is the first time that that the DPR made an appearance under the username Silk Road. Now, if you look at to this is June eighteenth of two thousand and eleven. So, if we look at the the price of Bitcoin at the time in the beginning of June had peaked at. $30 June 9th and went through some fluctuations and by the end of June it was down to $15.44 it started the beginning of June June 1st at $8.58 peaking at the highest point it was peaking at uh, $31.48 and then dropping back down to $15.44. So the value of a single Bitcoin has risen from the beginning of when Silk Road established to being 29 cents till it being around $15.44. 
around the end of June. And at this point, this is when Silk Road is started getting garnering some media attention and individuals that were not tech savvy and were not familiar with either Bitcoin or Tor were now approaching Bitcoin and the Tor site and seeking out Silk Road for the purchase of, you know, illegal narcotics. And so Silk Road's awareness level has elevated. Um, meantime, in the just in the history from the beginning of when Silk Road was established and all the way up to June when Silk Road began to receive um, some media attention, there has been some big moves um, within the Bitcoin world. Um, you had the government starting to talk about Bitcoin. Um, let's see. You had Mt. Gox. So January 28th of 2011, uh, 25% of the total Bitcoins generated were generated. So there was 5.25 million Bitcoins in circulation, which is 25% of the projected total of 21 million Bitcoins. So in January, towards the end of Silk Road's establishment, there was 5.25 million Bitcoins in circulation of the 20 million possible Bitcoins in existence. Um, uh, following the coverage of the fact that Bitcoin was now worth a dollar, uh, Bitcoin.org had been reached out by Slashdot and Hacker News, and along with Buzz on Twitter, uh, the site um, almost crashed due to the increase in traffic. Uh, you had a vehicle that was offered for Bitcoin, an individual paid. So it was 1984 Celic Super for 3,000 BTC and became the first person to offer a vehicle in exchange for Bitcoin. Uh, you had a number of different websites and resources being created in this period to encourage uh, and make people more familiar with Bitcoin. Um, Bitcoin Market in March of 2011 gets a major update. Uh, the Bitcoin market website reduces the minimum trade size, permits trading 24-7, and helps ensure the payments are made for executed trades. March 6 of 2011 is when Mt. Gox is sold. Uh, Jeb McCaleb sells Mt. Gox to Japan's Taiban company. A new high of nearly 900 gashes a second total for the Bitcoin network computing speed is reached. So that's how which computing power was needed to um, complete the Bitcoin network at the time. Um, like speculated. So basically what happened is that Jeb McClabe sold Mt. Gox to Mark uh, Karlopoulos. I can't remember pronounce his name, but Mark Karlopoulos, the Mt. Gox guy, the one that's in trouble for Mt. Gox. That's when the sale occurred and he became the owner of Mt. Gox. And then there was a huge crash in Bitcoin in June. So Silk Road receives a lot of media attention. Um, there has been a couple hacks of different wallets were occurring in this period of time. And then what happened was that a hacker causes Bitcoin to plunge to one cent. Uh, an intruder creates a huge Bitcoin sell-off on the cause and it causes the, the price to drop from $17 to one cent. And this was done on the uh, Mt. Gox exchange. What happened was they had a breach. And it caused a panic uh, within the Bitcoin world when this happened. Um, in April 16th of 2011, Time, a Time article publishes an article on Bitcoin and it talks about Bitcoin. So that elevates the level of awareness. Um, Mt. Gox uh, exchange in April 2011 uh, reaches out 
and passed his party with the Europe and British sterling pound. So the value of Bitcoin money stock passes 10 million in total. Um, the, the coin's second life, Linens, becomes the first market to trade Bitcoin against virtual currencies. So if you were a uh, second life user, you could trade Bitcoins for uh, Linens. And then basically difficulty really reaches. There was a breach in June of 2011. Uh, again, from Mt. Gox cause a bubble so June 12 2011 there was a bubble the largest theft of Bitcoin on the Bitcoin round Alvin claims that 25,000 BTC was stolen from his wallet at the time the exchange rate was about almost close to $375,000 so Bitcoin becomes you know there's um Increased awareness of Bitcoin. There's all these different companies coming into the space, all these different types of people. There's hacks, there's hackers, there's people stealing from one another. Um, it's being associated with a lot of different people. Uh, June 19th of 2011 is when the major breach at Mt. Gox occurred, uh, where their leaker names, leaker names were out, people's emails and addresses and passwords were compromised, and that's caused it. This, it caused a sellout and it forced the price down from $17.51 to a penny. So, and different companies, you know, bowed in and bowed out. BitPay, which is now a major um, wallet, e wallet, uh, launches itself on the smartphone June 29th of 2011. This allows um, for people to use their mobile devices to store and trade and sell their Bitcoins. And one of the, in August 5th of 2011, one of the biggest breaches of a wallet occurred on my Bitcoin. 150,000 Bitcoins was taken. Uh, the first conference in Bitcoin occurred in August in 2011. So while Silk Road was occurring and there was all these thefts and um, breaches and companies coming into the space of Bitcoin on the le legitimate side, uh, Silk Road was still doing its thing. The price, you know, fluctuated and it would go up and down throughout its existence. But just from here on out, I'm just going to slowly just talk about uh, Silk Road's existence. So on August 5th of 2011, uh, Silk Road opens forge uh, the Forgeries Marketplace. Uh, it's a place on their on their market where they they sell uh, fake government issued documents like driver's license, IDs, and passports. It's prohibited, however, for private issue documents like diplomas and certifications, tickets and receipts. Uh, counterfeit currency is still not permitted for sale in the money section. Um, then Altoid looks for a Bitcoin IT pro. So on August 11, 2011, um, the original individual that who announced um, Silk Road's presence posted a job ad for an IT pro in the Bitcoin community to work in a venture-backed Bitcoin startup company. Interested parties are asked to write to Ross Olberch at gmail.com. Allegedly, this link links out uh, Alto to Ross Olberch, putting him under the authority's suspicion. So, in October 2011, so 10 months into his existence, is seeking a a single individual that has some extra expertise in Bitcoin and. All inquiries were going to be sent to Ross Albrecht's Gmail, which creates a paper trail, which the feds love. Uh, and then Silk Road itself begins to experience what all other Bitcoin serv services have been experiencing. Uh, the site was the site goes down. 
in October 19th through the October 22nd. Um, they're basically going to have to build, rebuild the site, uh, but they state that it's not due to security breach. But basically, what happened was they had some unre- unreliable people who managed their server space across three countries, and so they had to switch their server space. And then in November 1st through November 30th, this is when law enforcement began to focus on Silk Road. Uh, law enforcement agents began making purchases on Silk Road, over 100 in total, according to the FBI complaint. So this is where the sting begins. This is when they start, uh, the federal government starts, uh, you know, their, their operations against Silk Road. Uh, Silk Road then, in December, switches its tour address so it would be easier for people to remember is Silk Road VV5 PIS 3R at uh, Onion uh, January 9th a new commission system announced uh, the user Silk Road who is allegedly supposed to be DPR Dread Pirate Roberts announces the change to Silk Road's commission system rates it will no longer be a flat rate but a higher amount for low price items and a lower amount for high price items many users complain but the response is whether you like it or not I'm the captain of this ship, you're here voluntarily, and if you don't like the rules of the game or you don't trust your captain, you can get off the boat. So basically, if you sold an item for 99 cents, the highest rate of the commission, say for example, was a uh, dollar for that transaction. But if you were to sell something for $100, and then the, the commission rate from Silk Road might be like five cents. So it basically was encouraging if you wanted to, to sell your high items at a higher rate, or if you sold your items at a lower rate, just expect to be paying out more for as far as commissions towards Silk Road. And then we enter the new year, and February 5th, 2012 is when Dread Pirate Roberts is born. On Silk Road forums, user Silk Road announces, I need an identity separate from the site and the enterprise in which I'm not only a part, I need a name. So he announces that he's changing his name to Dread Pirate Roberts, and this becomes the official forum and mouthpiece of Silk Road. So he goes on the Silk Road forums that are on the Tor network, and he basically announces that he's Dread Pirate Roberts. And this is where the federal government is establishing the link of the identity of Dread Pirate Roberts, not only to Silk Road, but the username to Silk Road, and then back to um, Ross Ulbrich. And then um, (coughs) DPR from now on is making all the announcements about Silk Road and any changes and adjustments to the site. He announces a new stealth mode for the site's superstar vendors at particular risk of becoming a target for law enforcement. Only users who know the vendor's specific address will be able to find them and they will be otherwise invisible to those viewing the site. So basically what they did is they already tour they're already on tour itself and within the silk road site they basically what they've done is they hidden uh certain um vendors so if you're a vendor and your name was pink bunny three the only people who would be able to find you is people that already knew your vendor name if they didn't know your vendor name and they started searching for you or looking for you or looking for your product they couldn't find you on the site through any search at all they had to know the name Pink Bunny 3 or they were not going to find you. So that was February 2012. In March 5th of 2012, Dread Pirate Roberts, we're going to call him DPR, asked uh, Stack Over for tech support. So Stack Overflow Overflow is a type of uh, tech support service. And someone creates an account on the program advice site stackoverflow.com with the name Ross Ulbrich and the email address rossolbrich at gmail.com The user posts two questions under the name. One, destroying the Pacific session and code initiator. And two, how can I connect to a Tor and service using crawl and PPH? Less than one minute later, the, the username was changed to Frosty with the email address frosty at frosty.com So basically, this was a, another connection and there you can say paper trail trying to establish Ross Ulbrich to the Dread Pirate name but most importantly is the branching out of the Silk Road site to seeking some tech support and then in April 1st 2012 
An undercover agent builds their case. An undercover federal agent based in Maryland poses as a smuggler with a large quantity of illegal drugs to move and requests assistance finding someone who wants to buy in large quantities. Uh, So he contacts us through the Silk Road site and communications continue for the rest of the year into January 2013. This uh, undercover agent is how the federal government was trying to build their case beyond just uh, purchasing off the site uh, associating you know individuals from the site Silk Road in particular Ross Albrecht and building their case using this undercover agent. So the undercover agent established a relationship with the Silk Road site beginning in April 2012. Uh, October 8th, 2012, Dread Pirate DPR uh, posts on the Silk Road form and basically states that everything about Silk Road in itself is just word of mouth. They're not going to advertise. They're not going to go out there and seek out people. It's just basically people are coming to them because they heard it from someone. And then uh, DPR talks about his, he wants to move his startup to Mecca. Uh, December 6, 2012, Ross Ulbrich and Ren Finley record an interview between themselves for Story Corps. They discuss, they discuss what it means to move from a place like Austin, Texas to San Francisco and was like to be at, there at this point in time. Um, they feel San Francisco is a Mecca for startups, more so than Austin. Um, and in, in, in this interview, Ross Ulbrich describes his re- relocation to San Francisco, Francisco around September 2012. Uh, this is important because the feds are going to use this um, as establishing um, Ross Ulbrich uh, to Silk Road because of all the IP addresses and all the technical information and data is generated from this area from San Francisco. And then beginning of January 1st, Almost two years after Silk Road has been established, uh, the other undercover agent that has been establishing his relationship through the Silk Road makes his move. Uh, the undercover agent from Maryland arranges the transport of one kilogram of cocaine to an unnamed Silk Road vendor slash employee. One kilogram of mixture with detectable amounts of cocaine is delivered and the equivalent of uh, 27K in Bitcoin is paid through the Silk Road system. A week later, a DPR reports to the undercover agent that the employee in question has been arrested and was responsible for the theft of the BTC from other Silk Road vendors. Still believing the the undercover agent is a trusted contact, DPR requests first that the employee be beaten up and forced to return the stolen funds, but later changes the request to murder. Fearing the employee will give up information, DPR and the agent agree on a sum of 80K in two 40K installments, one for to seal the deal and one after the job takes place. So this is where one of the first of the six uncharged murder for hire is established against Ross Albert the DPR, which the federal government is alleging he is, commissioned a hit on an employee for stealing money and basically for getting caught. And then through January 1st through February, this is when uh, Silk Road gets a competitor. It's called Black and Market Reload. It gains uh, 16,000 new registers and claims to move more items than Silk Road and has fewer scoopers, scruples. So basically allows more categories than Silk Road, like the Silk Road prohibits like weapons and bans assassination nation only because of tendencies to attract scammers. So they have more different categories that Silk Road won't touch, but you know, black market reload is going to do it. Just like in regular commerce, um, you know, Silk Road has com- competitors. People are going to go after each other. Uh, February 8th is when the same undercover agent through March 1st begins communicating with DPR and the agent suggests that the hit is arranged and taking place with an employee tortured to return to bitcoins and then murder. DPR requests a video or, or photo as proof and the agent responds with staged photos saying the victim's body was completely destroyed to eliminate evidence. Uh, DPR says I'm just p- pissed I had to kill him but what's done is done and I just can't believe he was so stupid. I wish more people had some integrity. So this is again is just linking DPR that identity to to murder. The case for a murder for hire, the undercover agent faked the employee's death who was in federal custody at this time. 
In the March 13th of 2013, a Silk Road vendor known as Friendly Chemist begins sending threats to DPR via the Silk Road's personal messaging system, saying he has a long list of real names and addresses of Silk Road vendors and customers. Uh, he obtained them through hacking to the computer of another large Silk Road vendor. Uh, Friendly Chem- Chemist provides proof and threatens to publish a list online unless DPR gives him uh, $500,000, which he says he needs to pay off his nar- narcotics supplier. Uh, DPR seeks the narcotics supplier and requests the narcotics supplier mention mention contact him directly instead to work something out. Five days later, Silk Road user Red and White contacts DPR claiming to be the said supplier. Uh, DPR March 26 makes an offer. We should talk about doing business. Obviously, you have access to illicit substances and quantity. And we are having issues with bad distributors. If you don't already sell here on Silk Road, I'd like you to consider becoming a vendor. Red, red and white response, I would consider it if friendly chemist meets with them and pays off his debt. Um, March 27th, this is where the second murder for hire comes from. In this case, uh, DPR writes back, in my eyes, friendly chemist is a liability. I wouldn't mind if he was executed. He proceeds to give out some personal information sending friendly chemist lives in White Rock, British Columbia, Canada, Canada with a wife and three kids. DPR has let me know if that would be helpful to have his full address. So DPR orders his second hit through Silk Road on March 27th through 2013. Uh, March 29th, um, the blackmail escalates. Uh, Friendly Chemist writes again, threatening to release the names of 5,000 users and 2,000 vendors if not paid with 72 hours. DPR says to Red and White, I would like to put a bounty on his head if that's not much trouble for you and later says it doesn't have to be clean and then March 30th red and, and white offers to perform the job for 150 or three hundred thousand dollars depending on if DPR wants it clean or not clean DPR complains politely suggesting that he previously had a clean hit done for 80k they eventually settle for BTC of 1670 which at the time was uh, 1670 BTC, which at the time was $150,000. Uh, Red White claims the job is done and DPR requests sends a photo of the victim. DPR appears satisfied with this, but the FBI complaint points out that Agent uh, Tarbell spoke to Canadian law enforcement authorities who have no record there of being any Canadian resident with the name DPR passed to Red and White as a target of, of the solicited murder for hire nor did they have any record of a homicide occurring in White Rock, British Columbia on or about March 30th, 2013. Um, and then a personal note, June 21st, 2013, Ross Olbert subleted a room in San Francisco apartment he found via Craigslist using the name Josh Trini on a fake ID that was intercepted by authorities. His roommates described Josh as a quiet loner and a freelance tra- tra- freelance cra- currency trader who socialized socialize little and spent most of his time working on his laptop. Uh, July tw- 23rd, 2013, the FBI gets an image of the Silk Road server. This is... Uh, this image of the server was made by someone in a certain foreign country where the server resides and provided the provided to the FBI. Uh, the Silk Road had now had uh, a little bit less than a, a million registered users and was conducting about $1.2 billion worth of business. So, Silk Road is established in January 1st of 2011. Basically, January the month of January of 2011. By July of 2013 it was doing 1.2 billion dollars so in two years it was a billion dollar business so july 24th through 2013 uh, 13 to july 31st through to 2013 uh, Albert is confronted at his San Francisco apartment by the Department of Homeland Security officials after they seize a shipment of fake IDs bearing Albert's photo and the alias he uses to rent his room. 
Olbers declines to answer questions, but tells them hypothetically it's possible for anyone to order such documents on a website called Silk Road. Despite this, Olbers does not leave the country or appear to make any attempt to flee. August 14th, uh, Dread Pirate DPR tells Forbes on being hunted. Uh, Andy Grimber, who is a staff reporter for Forbes on technology, privacy, and information, uh, published an article detailing his correspondence with DPR and the libertarian ideology that underpins the Silk Road project. Uh, DPR acknowledges that the highest levels of government are hunting me and seems to determine to spread his message to a wider audience while protecting his identity. At this point, the management of Silk Road is a collaborated effort. It's just, it's just, it's not just me making sure Silk Road runs smoothly. So while I make the final calls, I don't have 100% credit for any of the innovations on Silk Road, DPR says. Now, another uh, competitor to Silk Road, uh, Atlantis, shuts down. It was the most prominent in Boulder Black Market competitors on tour. It shuts down abruptly for security reasons and taking all its users' funds with it. So it scones with a lot of people's monies. Um, October 1st of 2013, Olbridge is indicted in Maryland. Maryland makes an indictment against Olbridge for the contract torture and execution of the former first former Silk Road employee vendor from February 2012. So that is one of the first uh, murder for hire uh, charges that Ross Olbrich is facing. Uh, he's arrested that day in a public library in San Francisco and charged with drug trafficking, computer hacking, and money laundering. He's due to be, to be extradited to the New York State from which most of this investigation took place. So he wasn't, um, he was not going to be tried in federal court in California. Um, he was going to be tried in New York because that is where the FBI investigation is taking place, which is smart on the feds and because uh, back east is a far, has a more, far more conservative stance when it comes towards um, drugs and a greater lack of understanding of the internet. So that was smart on the, in the feds case for them to have the entire investigation taking place back east versus taking place in California, where, you know, the, the California or any of the Western states have a laxer view on uh, narcotics, but more importantly, they have a greater understanding of how the internet and technology works. And say someone from back east. Um, October 2nd, uh, Silk Road is seized by law enforcement. Silk Road is shut down and replaced with a splash page declaring that the hidden site has been seized by the FBI in conjunction with the IRS, uh, the Criminal Investigation Division, ICE of Homeland Security, and the DEA. So a bunch of alphabet soups of federal investigators uh, shut down the site. Uh, Bitcoin value crashes when the news um, of this happens. One Bitcoin, which was trading at $125, goes to a low of $99. And this is attributed to the direct response of the arrest and the seizure of this site. Uh, The FBI arrests arrests and unseals a complaint on one of Silk Road's biggest dealers in Washington State on October 2nd. Uh, Rumors that the FBI can't get the BT stash appears that the FBI cannot actually get his hands on Ross Aldrich estimated 600,000 BTC stash which was then worth about 80 million dollars um, Silk all Road alternatives like black market reload and sheep marketplace see a surge in usage so the business continued uh, four men in the UK are arrested on suspicion of working through Silk Road that was October 8th of 2013 uh, it's October 16th. Of course, Hollywood has to get involved. And 20th Century Fox commissions a Dennis Lehan, who is responsible for Shutter Island and Mystic River, to write a movie script based on uh, Silk Road and his uh, the article by Joshua Davis from Epic Magazines. 
Then October 17th, uh, Black, it, Black Market Reload vanishes and reappears. Uh, it's the most popular Silk Road replacement since the shutdown. It self closes after a scramble to expand super capacity, saw its entire source code posted in public and revealing the identities of the operator, Black Opi, and possible user. 16 hours later, Black Market Reload returns with a new URL and promises a more robust security. Ross Ulbrich gives a, pre- a gives a prison interview on October 18th of 2013. He gives an interview to Lauren Smiley of the San Francisco M- Magazine from prison. Bitcoin at this time, the price of Bitcoin uh, returns to, to its value and on October 23rd. Uh, despite the initial claiming the demise of Silk Road would also signal the end of Bitcoin, uh, it goes back to its uh, $200 value. Uh, a wallet linked to Ross Ulbert sees his huge deduction of 36k uh, Bitcoin leaving the address. On October 25th, the rumors that the feds were on Silk Road from the start. There are claims that the for- law enforcement is active on Silk Road right from the beginning, setting up an uncovered drug bus, which we covered earlier in the timeline. October 25th, uh, Forbes breaks the story that the U.S. government PTC seizure story. Forbes runs the story in which an anonymous FBI source claims that 140,000 BTC was seized. Uh, the U.S. attorney in New York State later confirms this, and after the Bitcoins were found on a computer hardware belonging to Ross Ulbrich, this alt wallet, he says, was seized from DPR. So this, this is their establishment of Ross Ulbrich uh, as DPR through the media uh, as part of their a case against uh, Ross Ulbrich. Um, <clears throat> then we have the incident with Bit, Bit Instant, who is which was a uh, an exchange that enabled and allow people to trade BTC for USD. Uh, Charlie Sherman <clears throat> was arrested in Silk Road as a Silk Road connect. Con- connection basically the way they're stating is that charlie sherman knew that silk road was a drug site or illegal activity <clears throat> that he deliberately ran a exchange function off of silk road for usd he went by the name vendor name of btc king and basically <clears throat> he eventually was charged for money laundering and he eventually would plead to this uh, later on to the year and receive um, a two year sentence. Um, Charlie Sherman quits Bitcoin Foundation. He is um, out on a million dollar bill on the same day. A Silk Road vendor to lawyer up to sue for seizure of Bitcoins. So Silk Road merchant Peter Ward announced his intention to hire a lawyer to file a claim for 100 PCC. They said it was wrongfully seized from the U.S. government. Aldridge on February 7th of 2014 pleads not guilty and begins his long defense against his charges. Uh, March 20th of 2014, Australia may extradite an alleged Silk Road moderator. A former prison employee in Queensland named Peter Philip Nash is accused of operating as Batman 73 and same sayings but different on Silk Road. He may be extradited to the U.S. to stand trial. A play about Silk Road seeks funding for for Bitcoin on May 21st through 2014. Um, they raised 40 BTC. It, debat- it debuts at the Edinburgh Festival. On June 12th, the U.S. Marshals announces an auction of 30,000 BTC. So this is the uh, a portion of the seized Bitcoin that the uh, feds had. They they had an auction, which is what the U.S. Marshal does within a seize uh, property. Uh, from criminals mind you that at this point in time and this is an issue when it comes towards uh, particularly drug cases that the U.S. government and local governments seize individuals properties and then turn around and sell and sell that said property and keep the funds for law enforcement purposes even though no charges may even be filed or no individual has been found guilty yet uh, this is a practice that the um, U.S. Attorney Office 
had, had issued an order that uh, state and local governments can no longer participate in this federal program of as beginning of January of this year. But, as a, but on the federal level, it's still, this type of activity is still occurring. But June 12th of 2014 is the first time um, BTC is auctioned, is up for auction by the U.S. government. And the U.S. Marshals Service on June 18th accidentally exposes a list of auction inquirers. Um, so basically there was an email address where they list all the individuals who are seeking to bid on this uh, Bitcoin and was leaked to the public. Uh, several names came out on March 19th, oh, not actually, but June 19th of 2014, announcing that they are submitting bids to the, the U.S. Marshal Service for the Silk Road. Uh, June 27th of 2014, City, City Bank uh, and releases an act, auction impact. The bank giant City releases a report and an analysis of the possible impact of the U.S. Marshal's uh, services auction of the C's Silk Road Bitcoin on the price of cryptocurrencies on the eve of the bid submission deadline. Um, the, uh, June 29th, uh, Barry Silbert, uh, he is uh, the owner of Second, Mark, Second Market, which is a Bitcoin company. He reveals that he is making a bid and he confirmed that he's using a syndicate model, which is a bunch of individuals gathered together to purchase and make a bid. On June 30th, uh, the U.S. Marshals releases an update on the Silk Road bid auction. They had more than 40 registered bidders participate in the U.S. MSC event with 63 bids received over the course of the auction. On July 1st, uh, Bitcoin prices surge as Silk Road auction spurs investors' interest. So it didn't. Ex um, at the press time, there was evidence to this claim as Bitcoin has seen a seven percent increase um, from its price at the time. So that's July first of two thousand and fourteen. Let's just look at the price of the impact of the seized Bitcoin. So as of July, one single pip Bitcoin was six hundred and forty dollars, and it went up seven percent as a result of the announcements about the auction to six hundred and fifty-two dollars and some change. Uh, the winner of that round of Bitcoin auction was Tim Draper. He's a VC, a venture capitalist. He won the bid for 29 for the 30K of Bitcoins. Uh, the July 3rd, there's an article that appears that um, the spike in Silk Road interest is no boon for Ross Ulbricht's defense fund. Despite the increase in media attention surrounding Friday's auction of the 30K of BTC seized from the Silk Road, the website seeking to clear his name of the online black marketer, uh, 30 year old Ross Ulbricht, has, has not seen an increase in donations. Uh, Bitcoin magnate Roger Veer offers to donate $10 for every retweet of his message in support for Free and Ross Ulbricht campaign. That is July 7th of 2014. Ross Ulbricht loses bid to dismiss, dismiss his, the federal case against him on July 10th of 2014. Uh, Ross Ulbricht Silk Road fence invokes the Fourth Amendment when... Um, and Priotal motion is calling on the court to dismiss the case on the grounds of the Fourth Amendment privacy protection. Uh, new draft drug trafficking charges are added to the Ross Ulbricht case on August 22nd. Um, A 
August 30th, uh, Charlie Sherm hopes to walk free after guilty plea. This is when he start, begins to make his plea agreement, which is something he did do. He for, forfeits 950k to the U.S. government as part of his plea agreement. And basically what it is is that... Um, he pleads guilty to aiding and embedding an unlicensed money transmitting business. Um, Ross Elbridge on September 5th pleads not guilty to the new drug charge is laid against him. On September 9th, 2014, the FBI said that no illegal techniques were used in the Silk Road investigation. The U.S. government's case against accused Silk Road and ringleader Ross Elbridge takes an important step forward with the FBI release of new information relating to how it allegedly discovered the infamous online mark black market. September 15th, uh, 2014, uh, Silk Road 2.0 is hit by a sophisticated DODS attack. Uh, the online black market Silk Road 2.0 experiences a DODS so Basically, it was DOS, which eventually leads to um, it being shut down. October 3rd of 2014, uh, Albert seeks a pretrial hearing to challenge an FBI claim. This is a lot of uh, legal ease about him, you know, fighting his battle against the federal government. Uh, the court delays Rod's Albert Silk Road trial until January 2015. And that brings us up to now. Um, it is in its sixth day the trial is occurring. So let's just go from its time of existence. Which ended in October of 2013. So, from the month of January 2013, when Bitcoin was around 30 cents, until it was shut down in October, the price of Bitcoin was like $125. So, basically went from a quarter to $125 throughout its existence with, you know, peaks and valleys with the highest amount at its time of its existence was, come on, it had jumped up to 200, look, It jumped up to the highest point at $230. Now, while Ross Ulbrich was going through his process of legal battles and issues, Mount Gox was collapsing around the same period of time. Its troubles began around the same time that Ross Ulbrich did. Let's see. So the same year that Ross or Dread Pirate Roberts or Silk Road began to be infiltrated by the feds beginning of April of 2012. Uh, Mark Co Mark Co Caropolis, I cannot say his name, so Mark K, the CEO then of 
the largest Bitcoin exchange. You know, he speaks about the price breakthrough, which occurred April 1st of 2013 is when Bitcoin hit $100. And Mt. Cox has 76% of the share, the exchange share of Bitcoin trades. So Mt. Cox was the de facto biggest exchange out there for Bitcoin of April 2013. And it's the same month that the undercover federal agent begins to um, infiltrate and pose as a smuggler on um, Silk Road. So I'm just going to go through some key points because at that point, April, $100 is a lot of money for a single Bitcoin. So April 24th is when a, a DODS attack occurred uh, on Mt. Gox. Um, it failed to instill fear in the market, but they did get some away with some coin in 2013. Uh, Mt. Gox announces its delay as support for Litecoin. Uh, it had initially planned to, but it was delaying its it plan. Uh, this is when some legal issues began to occur. Uh, Coin Lab alleges that despite its con- contractual de- obligation, Malcox continued to market to customers in New- North America and did not provide Coin Lab with the data and service access. So, this is when the disputes with other companies began with uh, Malcox and is being sued as beginning of May 3rd, 2013. Uh, Homeland Security stops Dewalla transaction with Mt. Cox. Dewalla began reporting Tuesday afternoon that an order from the U.S. Department of Homeland Security was preventing him from transferring funds to and from Japan-based Mt. Cox. Mt. Cox is based in Japan. It's not a U.S. company. It's a Japanese company. Uh, and then the DHS see, use a warrant to seize... Um, a seven-page warrant affidavit by a special agent of the HS stated that they probable cause to believe the contents of a specific Dwalla account are subject to seizure and fortures under U.S. law. So this is when some legal issues begin with Mt. Cox. Mt. Cox ban- bans anonymous currency deals. It would no longer accept anonymous accounts. At this point, Mt. Cox accounted for 80% of all Bitcoin trade beginning May 30th of 2013. So this is when they begin to transition to some kind of compliance with governments. And you can no longer be an anonymous user on, on Mt. Cox on this exchange. So uh, June 4th, Mt. Gox stopped using Techno Cash, which was linked by US, the U.S. to Liberty Reserve. Uh, it was an Australian service. Uh, it was linked to a $6 billion money laundering case of all in Liberty Reserve. So this is when, again, more legal issues begin with Mt. Gox. Uh, June 10th of 2013, um, the first complaints about Mt. Gox began to really surface. June 20th, Mt. Gox temporarily suspends USD withdrawals. It said it was in response to the growing volume of deposits and, it's, and that's when it stopped. Um, BitPay, which is the one of the biggest wallet providers out there and the biggest one of the bigger um, Bitcoin cryptocurrency companies announced that it would stop using the exchange because uh, it had issues with the invoices and the way the market uncertainty. June 29th of 2013, Mt. Gox registers with FinCEN as a money service business. This is um, this has to do with the US, on the U.S. end. Um, they require, if you want to basically what FinCEN does, it regulates money transactions. And if you have an ATM machine, a debit card, vendor machine, if you're a bank, you have to register with FinCEN if you're transmitting money. And transmitting money to them means if if Bob has an ATM machine, he puts money into the ATM machine and Jill goes over and slides her car to withdraw the money out of the account, Bob has to have a basically he has to have a license to do that. And since Mt. Gox is taking cryptocurrencies the Bitcoin and he's they're trading it out for USD they're considered a money transmitting service because people can also purchase Bitcoins through them by exchanging money for that type of good and service they're considered a money transmitter so he has to reg- they have to register July 4th is when they started re- resuming withdrawals if we go back into the history of Silk Road 
in July. They get this one in um, July of 2013. This is when the Homeland Security begins to confront Ross Ulbrich. Uh, the FBI had, you know, the image of this Silk Road server. begin to pres- they begin their first wave of a- of arresting and and making charges against him with the re- the initial arrest of having those false identity papers um in august 12th of 2013 rumors began them out Cox because of the growing pains and because of the fact that it's such a large the largest exchange uh they're having issues with banks about withdrawing funds uh, the U.S. government actually seizes $2.9 million from the Bitcoin exchange from Mt. Gox um, from Multisiglum and LCC, a subsidy of the Bitcoin exchange of Mt. Gox. So this is when things begin to heat up on Mt. Gox's end. This is the same month that the Dread Pirate Roberts begins to state that he's being hunted by the U.S. government. Um... September 16th, you know, Mt. Gox countersues um, the Coin Lab, who is suing them for breach of contract issues. And then a month after Ross Ulbrich is um, arrested, which was October 1st, 2013. And then Silk Road is soon seized after. Uh, BTC China beats Mt. Gox and Bitstamp to become the world's number one Bitcoin exchange. So the China, the Chinese market becomes a very huge uh, market and it is having a greater volume of Bitcoins passed through it in that week compared to Mt. Gox and Bitstamp. And then this is when a really serious issues begin to happen. Uh, Bit, Bitstamp shows a higher Bitcoin price than Mt. Gox. Uh, the prices of Bitcoin on Mt. Bitstamp increased above the level listed on Mt. Gox on November 22nd, 2013. So there's a bit of a, you might say a price war. Some people say the price war or the fact that both of these companies were not actually trading Bitcoin for what is, the real value was. And that was November 22nd of 2013. Uh, November 28th, Mt. Gox adds an extra security with one-time password card. Basically, you have to generate a password to link to your account. And then Mt. Gox has his own little price volatility issue where it has Bitcoin price up to 50% higher than the rival exchanges. Um, this is a noted and analyze, and a lot of people have some serious issues about the manipulation of the exchange by the, the company Mt. Gox, and their practices are becoming in question. Um, March 19th, oh, no, no, March, but December 19th, Mt. Gox decides to celebrate the holidays, and they've recently reached 1 million customers by offering a special fee discount. And so that begins the begin of the uh, beginning of the new year. Um, this is when the collapse of Mt. Gox began to happen. Uh, people were not able to withdraw their coins or their money is being held on the exchange. It was having issues of doing that. February and that began February fourth of two thousand fourteen. February seventh of two thousand fourteen, Mt. Gox halts all Bitcoin withdrawal prices, and the prices across the board just plummet. Uh, they cite the increase of traffic. This has been with all the withdrawals. Um, many question the future of Mt. Gox on February 8th. February 10th, Mt. Gox blames Bitcoin flaw for the withdrawal d- d- delays. Um, people begin to, to seriously question the claims with the withdrawals and the issues that Mt. Gox is having. People are criticizing the fact that they couldn't get their funds and money. And then eventually what happens is that on February 14th, the price of Bitcoin sticks to $300 and it continues to fall. And 
And then Mt. Gox announced on February 15th that it wouldn't allow anyone to deposit any Bitcoins on its site. February 15th, uh, 68% of Mt. Gox users still awaiting their funds. It's still having issues. Um, the 17th, um, on February 20th, the price hits 135 on Mt. Gox, which is different from all the other exchanges. On Mt. Gox, the price falls below 100, its lowest level since July of last year. Uh, people started showing up at the Mt. Gox site and protesting it. Mt. Cox holds trading on February 25th of 2014. And then Mt. Cox just comes out and comes clean and states that it allegedly lost um, $350 million worth of Bitcoin, which was uh, 740,000 BTC is lost, is gone, is rumored to be insolvent, and it was eventually shuts down. So a lot of people lost their funds. Bitcoin prices plummeted for a little bit. And thus begins the ongoing investigation into Mt. Gox by various companies and different agencies throughout the world. Uh, in January 1st of this year, uh, the Japanese government, which had been investigating the, um, Mt. Gox, Throughout the year of 2014, believe it was an inside job. Uh, February 28th of 2014, Mouth Cox files for bankruptcy, claiming six, $630.6 million in debt. They admit that they lost the Bitcoins and the company lost 100K of its own Bitcoins. But as of January of this year, uh, the Japanese government believes it was an inside job and that it wasn't any hacking or any issues. Uh, any hacking or any malleability issues or any software issues that it was an inside job that stole the customer's funds. So the reason why I bring up Mt. Gox, besides being the one of the biggest uh, Bitcoin exchanges, is because in the defense of Ross Ulbrich, uh, they have alleged that Mark Kolopoulos, Mark, Mark K, is actually DPR. He's actually de the Dread Pirate Roberts. And at one point in the initial investigation of Silk Road, uh, the federal government themselves thought that Mark Cro Mark K was dead. Dread Pirate Roberts. They've since settled on the fact that Ross Ulbrich uh, is DPR, but it puts the seed of doubt in the trial that Mark K, who operated Mt. Gox, um, which has allegedly, some people allegedly allege that he's the, the master behind mastermind behind. Uh, the collapse of Mt. Gox, that he, he's the one who's gone in with the monies, or he can just be so incompetent that he allowed for the stealing of the funds. But the reason why I bring him up is because of the fact that a seat, again, they're using that is another guy that is responsible for the actions that are committed by DPR and that is not Ross Albrecht, but it's this other gentleman who's facing his own legal issues and scrutiny. So just kind of sum up this entire timeline in this episode in a quick little nutshell. Uh, Satoshi Nakamoto had the idea of Bitcoin in 2007. He then, in the year 2009, released that concept to the world in January of 2009. January of 2011, Ross Ulbrich, who admitted to creating Silk Road, created Silk Road, 
within two years, a little bit more than two years, on October of 1st of 2013, when the site was shut down, his site generated at least $1.2 billion allegedly by the government in narcotics trade with Bitcoin as the primary means of payment for those goods and services. That's how people got paid. That's how people were purchasing goods and services on that site. $1.2 billion in two years was generated just in that site alone through Bitcoin sales for USD. That's what the, the Bitcoin did. That's what Silk Road did. And now Ross Ulbrich, the creator of the Silk Road site, is facing 30 years to life with the charges he's facing for creating the Silk Road site and the alleged crimes that he is allegedly, um, alleged of being committed, having committed. That's just amazing. But most, what's the most amazing part, and I'm going to save that for the third third episode, is just the, the extent that the federal government so aggressively went after Ross Ulbrich. I mean, from within a year's time, within months really, from the conception of Silk Road and it being out on the internet, the federal government just targeted Silk Road. And it's important to understand why and what that means for personal freedom and the use of Bitcoin in itself. But again, that's going to be part of the uh, the third episode. So I'm just going to end it right here. I'd like to thank you for listening. Thank you for listening to my show. You can find me, Hero Job Shibe, on the Twitter at Musings of a Shibe. You can find me at Google Plus as Musings of a Shibe. You can also find me on Facebook as Hero Job Shibe or Musings of a Shibe. You can also click on the show notes and look into the links and click directly onto those links. You can find me on uh, my webpage with Musings of a Shibe at uh, wordpress.com, the subreddit Musings of a Shibe podcast. You can also email me directly as Musings of a Shibe at Outlook. You can find the show and listen to the show on iTunes, Mixcloud, SoundCloud, Stitcher, TuneIn Radio, Crypto Bucket, and SFXIO. You can also find Nerdist Podcast, me at Nerdist Podcast Coalition Group, a great podcast coalition on the Facebook. Thank you and have a great day. To the moon.